Here in Shropshire is a farm frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. Last year, Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn brought it back to life, as it would have been in the 1880s. Oh, no. Under the watchful eye of their landlord, Thomas Acton, they enjoyed many successes. Here it comes. <laughs> Cute and cuddly. And tasted failures. First time in sewing a crop myself, and then come the big day, he's lame. As their time on the farm ended, it was a year that none of them would ever forget. Now they're returning to the farm. I'm in. Welcome. Welcome. To celebrate a Victorian Christmas. Bangs of expectation. Bangs of expectation. On a grand scale. <laughs> They'll learn new skills. Oh, good grief. <laughs> and be tested to the limit as they return once more to life on the Victorian farm. Don't not spoil it. OK. So here's to hard-working Victorian, hard Victorian farmers. Hard-working Victorian farmers. Cheers. Before the Christmas festivities begin, the team must get the farm ready for winter. That means bringing in new livestock. What are you looking for? Just to see if he's got his manly bits about him. Stockpiling food for themselves. If you don't put your back into it, you really notice the difference. And the animals. I think we're going to get a really good crop off of this. But farmers are always at the mercy of the weather. It's been a year since the team left the Victorian farm. They have an appointment with the estate's owner, Mr Acton, and his son Rupert is on his way to take them there. Rupert's picking us up, isn't he? I believe so. What time did he say? Uh, he said, uh, I think it's 3 o'clock. Glad to be back. It's weird, isn't it? It is a bit strange. It is a bit strange coming back. I'm looking forward to seeing Mr Acton again, though. Yeah. Catching up yeah. with the uh, affairs of the farm, see yeah. what's happened over the last year. <laughs> <laughs> What a welcome. Has it been a busy year while we've been gone? It certainly has, yes. I've been doing quite a lot of Rupert's work. got big plans for the team. Really? Right. Right. We'd like you to recreate the Victorian Christmas at Acton Scott. Right. What, for the whole estate? So, yes. Large oh, style. my giddy art. <laughs> <laughs> when Rupert said, you know, that we're to do Christmas for everybody, there's a bit of me that's a bit daunted, I suppose, but, but I'm also quite excited about it because I, I do like entertaining. I like, I like putting on a big spread. So this, this Christmas feast it's you want us to lay on, I mean, what sort of scale are we talking about here? Uh, I would think in the order of uh, uh, 30 to 40 uh, <gasps> individuals. Uh... Right. For me personally, Christmas is about coming together. It's going to be about uniting a community. Victorians didn't invent Christmas, but they made it what it is today. They brought us Christmas cards, paper decorations, crackers, and of course, Christmas trees. I'm sure, I see some amazing large scale decorations in a book. But as far as this Victorian Christmas is concerned, well, I remain to be convinced I'm a bit of a Scrooge. I really can't stand the sort of modern commercial Christmas, and in many ways, I blame the Victorians for that. And there's the hall. I'm looking forward to seeing Mr. Acton. Welcome. Oh, Mr. Acton. Yeah. Very good Hello. to see you again. Yes. Are you well? Yes, thank you. Jolly good. Hello, Peter. Hello, Mr. Acton. <laughs> Pleasure to see you again. Sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good firm handshake. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly good to be back, Mr. Acton. Yes. Well, we're just coming to the busy time of year. Right. I'm very glad to have you. Jolly good. Christmas may be a few months away, but preparations have. must start well in advance. I'm sure you'll be more than capable of doing it. Have you had to get through the winter, a Victorian farmer needed a good stock of hay to feed his animals. The survival of his farm depended on it. Well, now, this is the first task. Right. This is a meadow which has grass and clover and we want to have it made into hay for next winter's animals to live on. Right. 
So hay harvest is going to be our first big job. It is. <laughs> big job is the option yes. there. Hay is made from a combination of grasses, which are cut and then dried in the field. A good crop will depend on the weather. And uh, that's the main thing we want to avoid is rainfall. Last year, the hay crop was destroyed by rain. It was the major failure of their 12 months on the farm. Um, I think I'm slightly daunted by the prospect again this year. Naturally. Well, you can't dictate the weather, but uh, when it's right, you must get on with it as quickly as you can. They only have a few weeks if the hay is to be harvested in its prime. The team's base for their year was a labourer's cottage, which they restored from scratch. But since their departure, Rupert has been making changes to it. It's absolutely... Brings the light in, doesn't oh, it? Oh, where's my garden gone? Ah, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I've actually seeded your, your, your garden to grass, but uh, there is some compensation over here. All that work. I've actually oh. made you a new garden in this position, but it needs a bit of work. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I thought perhaps you could plant some vegetables for the Christmas celebrations. Oh, here. right. Yeah. But the real surprise is that Rupert's added a whole new room to the cottage. Gracious. Ooh. Lovely, brand new copper. Yes, well, I know how much you love doing laundry. <laughs> with, so. <laughs> I be built you your very own copper. <laughs> Coppers were used to heat water for many household tasks. This one can hold about 15 gallons. Oh, it's lovely. Great big, big brick box with a fireplace. Oh, it's so clean. Hasn't there not been a fire it's in here? It's never been used yet, so uh, you'll be the first one to use it. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're just for laundry, but they're really useful cooking vessels, especially when you've got to do great big puddings and things, you know, big boil in the bags and... Actually, Christmas pudding. Yes. Seeing as I've got to do for all those people, that'd be perfect, wouldn't it? it? Yes. Go and have a look at Clumper? Yes. Hello, fella. How are you? Long time no see, eh? How are you? Right? Clumper was the team's shire horse. Last year, he went lame. Yeah, lovely. It's lovely and smart. Although he's made a full recovery, he's it's it, crucial yeah. he stays fit. Now, the question mm. is, are we going to be able to get him out and do some work with him? See if we can remember how to tack him up. Yes. Go. Okay. The Shire horse's tack was perfected in the Victorian period. It evolved from what was used on oxen in earlier centuries. So I think he's lost a bit of weight, unlike us. A horse like Clumper can pull around one and a half tonnes. Now, this was always the difficult thing for Clumper. Yeah. Because he never used to like this bit in his mouth. Stand still. Stand there. That's it. There, there we go. go. That's Ooh. a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> it's always a wrestle. <laughs> I mean, the trick that myself and Alex were taught, put the thumbs right in the corner of the mouth, there are no teeth, and that makes them bite, move their teeth open. He was a powerful horse, even if he was a bit lame last year. Good to be back, isn't it? Yeah. The boys want to see how well he's recovered by using him to pull a cart in their old farmyard. Uh, I can see a little pair of ears and a fixed eye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to see him being used, isn't it? And here's the Thomas Corbett tip cart. Are you all right, with the, are you all right with the first complicated manoeuvre of the uh, afternoon, Peter? Back. This really is the toughest Back. job, really. Back, Clumper. Back. Good lad. Good lad. Back. Good Back. lad. Whoa. Good boy. Oh. Steady, steady, steady. That's all right, steady. The tip cart's loaded with manure for use in the new vegetable garden. Steady. Good boy. As they set off, all eyes are on Clumper's hind legs. There's no signs of stiffness there, so looks like he's made a full recovery. Good boy. 
How's he feeling? All right? Yeah, he's looking good, though, isn't he? Yeah. We might be able to use him for our hay harvest. Wow, look at that. Our cottage. Doesn't it look smart? <laughs> good lad, Whoa. that's brilliant. That's good perfect. Boy. Spot on. Stand. Well, that saved us a lot of shoveling. Yeah, <laughs> shame you can't tip it into the cart. This should keep. Ruth happy. I thought the first thing I'd do with my lovely new copper is um, make some soap to do the cleaning. Making your own soap at home is something that people have been doing for generations. Um, and there are in the Victorian period still any number of soap recipes in ordinary household manuals. All soap, wherever you buy it from or wherever you make it, is just a fat and an alkali mixed together, in essence. The alkali releases the acids in fat, reacts with them and forms soap. It could be any sort of fat. So I'm just using some rather old beef fat that I managed to catch off the butchers. So I'm starting off by popping it in the copper and letting it all boil down into a liquid, basically. That's going to take quite a while. The alkali Ruth's using is caustic soda. So I'm going to add my caustic soda into the water. You have to be really careful when you do this because an exothermic reaction will occur, which means it'll sort of boil all by itself, chemically. It's great. Something quite violent is beginning to happen in there. Oh, gosh, it is. Well, there's a nice selection of bits and pieces over here, isn't there? Now they've seen Clumper in action, the boys must inspect the haymaking equipment. Going like this. Yeah, good for rowing up. They've dug out their trusty farming Bible, Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm, for advice on what to use. Throughout the 19th century, thousands of workers flocked from the countryside to the cities. As part of this upheaval, much farm work became mechanised. This one here in the book of the farm, and this kicks it up, yeah, tedding of hay. Alex and Peter will be relying on this labour-saving machinery. And there's one piece of kit they'll need more than any other. This is the, uh, the daddy, though. This is the thing that we're... is really going to save us some labour, isn't it? What, the Bamford hay loader? What a wonderful piece of kit. The hay loader scoops up the hay and lifts it onto a horse-drawn wagon, or dray. Traditionally, you have a whole army of villagers pitching the hay up onto the dray with pitchforks. But in the late 19th century, you've got a shortage of labour. So these kind of devices really are a bit of a godsend. Right, so we'll get this out, shall we? Yes, let's give it a have try. It. Shall we go together? Yep. OK, I'm clear right. at the moment. Just let me... Right, uh, stop, 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 stop. I mean, that's heavy. <laughs> that's got to be heavy. <laughs> Here it comes. OK, have I got clearance up there yet? Yeah. Nice, Peter, nice. The Bamford's hay loader yeah. weighs nearly a quarter of a tonne. OK. I'm going to need you up here to put this down for you. It really hangs, that goes down. OK. Just ever so dumb. Oh. 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 Welcome back to the Victorian farm. Yeah. <laughs> it smells soapy. It certainly no longer smells of fat. I'm just going to pop a little handful of common salt in. Don't need a lot. Get a good stir. Oh, yes, look, something's happening immediately. There it is. There's a solid forming. That solid is soap. This is my hard soap, quite caustic and tough, so it's good for doing really filthy, dirty jobs where you need something super powerful. This is going to be super hard soap. I can tell by the very white graininess as I push it into the mould. It'll set rock solid. 
The soap takes around four hours to set. So I'm just giving this chamber pot a really good go with a more caustic soap. And it's brilliant for this sort of job. Yeah. Alex and Peter are struggling to get the halo to working. And then it goes underneath the big complicated piece of kit, this. That chain is tight, but it's on. Is that going to be too tight to give it a try now, do you think? Uh, who knows? Should we give it a go? Yeah, yeah. let's give it a go. Come on. Right. Right. Let's go. Yep. And there we go. Like probably... Excellent. So we're at the dray. This is attached to the dray, being pulled by the horse. The dray is the cart that we're loading the hay onto. Yeah. And this machine's driving these spikes, which will be lifting the hay up this elevator, tipping it right to the top. Whoa! Over the top. Onto the dray. Onto the dray. And hopefully, that's going to save us an inordinate amount of work in the field. It's ready to go. Right, do you want to put this back in then and I'll go and check the other bits of kit? <laughs> While it's, things are still quiet, I thought I might get on with a couple of preparations. I'm going to get started on the mincemeat for Christmas. It's one of those things that the further in advance you make it, the better it tastes. Ruth is using a recipe from the 1850s containing lemons, apples, raisins, currants and candied peel. If you go back to the medieval periods and you look for mince or shred pies, you'll find that they're mostly meat um, and then, then they're just sweetened and flavoured with a little bit of raisin and a little bit of spice, which were fearfully expensive ingredients at the time. And of course over time, as these expensive imported ingredients begin to drop in price, people put more and more in. And gradually the meat content goes down and the sweet content starts to rise. And in the 19th century, for many people, that meat element just falls away completely. The only thing, however, that sort of harks back and tells you where it came from is the suet. Um, and modern mincemeat does mostly still contain suet. And suet, of course, is fat from a cow. In particular, this is a piece of what gets, sometimes gets called a cod lie, which means um, the fat which hangs near a cow's cods. Cod is an old word for genitalia. And finally, last ingredient, brandy. The mincemeat will be stored in jars to absorb the liquid becoming sweet and juicy over the coming weeks. It should be really delicious and make the most wonderful mince pies for Christmas. A week into their return, it's time for a catch-up. You look like a man who needs a top up there, Peter. Thank you very much. Go on in, get that down your neck. So mm. what state is all the hay in? It doesn't look too bad. As the grass is coming through and give it a couple of weeks, it'll, uh, I'm sure, be ready to cut. But it's largely going to be a case of keeping the eye on the weather. Yes. What a familiar story. <laughs> Every time we talk about making hay, there's some sort of dark cloud comes, comes over in, as if to say, don't yes. even try it. Yes. So, Ruth, what do you think of the cottage, then? It's so posh, isn't it, in comparison to what it was when we were here last? It's good to be back. It's good to see you again. Cheers. Cheers. Much good old Acton cider. You can feel it going down. With a few weeks to go before the hay's ready to cut, there are plenty of other jobs to do. The estate's flock of Shropshire sheep needs a new ram, and the run-up to winter is the perfect moment to choose one. The ram can then be introduced to his ewes in time to produce lambs for spring. Where better to find a top-class animal than at the Royal Agricultural Society of England's annual show? The show was started by the Victorians in 1839. Today it's held at Stoneleigh Park in Warwickshire. Dr John Wilson is the society's librarian. Did you know on the farm yourself, the whole thing about 
the society and about the shows was this achievement of excellence. The finest livestock, but also the best type of farming. It was very competitive. It was a great distinction to have a prize, not only to the owner of an estate or the owner of a farm, but for the stockmen, the workers and so on. Don't forget, Britain at that time was the stock farm of the world. The Victorians were masters of animal breeding, and their skills were among the most celebrated and highly prized in agriculture. Selecting the right ram could determine the quality of a farmer's flock and his profits for years. Peter's called in an old friend, Richard Spencer, to help. Richard has five decades' experience of sheep farming. I've been tasked to come purchase a ram for our flock. Ah. So I've called on you for a bit of advice, if I may. Responsibility big. Big, yes. OK, well, you've come to the right place. There are quite a few different breeds here, and you've got some really good examples of the different breeds. And uh, when we've had a look, you can make your own decision, then we'll take it from there. OK, thanks. You make the decision, you're spending the money. Richard's lined up four Victorian breeds for Peter to choose from. We've got two Hampshires, two Shropshires, two Wensleydales, and two Oxfords. The Oxfords are the first in line. So what exactly am I feeling for here? Well, what are you wanting these sheep for? You want these sheep for the meat. You put your hand there, the jigger. That's your Sunday roast, new potatoes, garden peas. Imagine carving a slice of meat off that. Oh, I couldn't wish for better. Mint sauce, beautiful. These are totally different. These are a long wool breed. These are Wensleydales. These will milk their socks off. With more milk, do you get a better quality of lamb? You may well get a faster growing lamb because right. using them on the Shropshires. Yes. That'll be the sit. The Shropshires will provide the base, and these just put a little bit something different in there. Would you be looking for anything on the face of the sheep? Well, if ever you're looking to buy a ram, you want something that's masculine. You don't want a ram with a weak, little, pathetic, effeminate face. That's right in the right place. But a ram, it's not. A ram has got to be macho, in control, ready to go, to take mm. on the flock of ewes. And you want a ram with an aggressive face. All these rams have got it. Next, they move on to the Shropshires, the only breed of ram Peter has any experience with. What's a ram there for? Well, it's, it's there to uh, progress my flock. Exactly, to breed. What does he breed with? His wedding tackle. Of course. And there must be two of them underneath, hanging level. Beautiful. I mean, you've got to make this decision. I don't envy you. So basically, I've got to picture the offspring from this mm. and Absolutely. my flock. Absolutely. That's a very, very difficult choice to make. That is what breeding is all about. Back at the farm, with the hayfield growing fast, Alex is busy preparing for the harvest. Hello, Ian. He's come to see Acton Scott's resident woodworker, Ian Wall. Um, Ian, we've got a, a hay harvest imminent, and one of the tools we're in desperate need of is a hay rake. And apparently you're the man to show me how to make one. I can do that. The hay rake is an essential tool for gathering the crop in the field. It's made from an ash log. And the idea is you're going to split that with an axe and a mallet. Put it in a mallet, OK. So you place the axe in the centre and smack it with this. So right, OK, go. OK. It's done there. And how, how many blows do you think this is going to take? Uh, to... Well, I think you'll probably do it in about ten. Two. One. No, it's two. Three. It's a bit like a fairground game, isn't it? It is. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Go on, go for it. Nine. One more. Oh. Ten. Right, OK. You failed there, Alex. I failed? Well, it's not split. Hang oh, it's on still a splitting. I can hear it. Oops. Ah. I've got the axe stuck. Keep going, keep going. Um, move. There we are. I'll hold the axe. I hate that to see that blunted on your leg. Get in there, look. There we are. You're now looking at something that no one in the world has seen before. What? The inside of this tree. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And this, this is the original sapling that was growing. The very, right. the very heartwood. Right. The wood is shaved into a rectangular shape in order to make the head of the rake. Uh, this is the vice where we're going to drill the holes. Right. Okay. So we've got and our it, rake head here. It will sit in there. Just tip it forward, 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 yep. forward, forward, a bit more, a bit more. No more. Stop. Okay. Right. So the trick is here, keeping them all on a good alignment because you don't want your rake ending up buck-toothed. 
Next come the teeth. We're going to knock this bit of wood yep. onto this uh, metal bar, which is hollow. Yeah. And as we knock it, it will come through and yep. out the other side. OK, so there you go. Your first time. Right, OK. Woodworkers like Ian were common in much of the Victorian countryside. But despite being highly skilled, they were called bodgers, and the work they did was known as bodging. Ian has a theory about this. A bodger, he worked with green wood. He would make the legs and the spindles for chairs. Mm. And because it was green, they then needed to dry out. And one theory is, when you made the holes in the seat, a round hole, you go to put the leg in, and the leg had dried out, and as it dries, it shrinks, and it doesn't quite fit. So you could say that was a bodge job. But it wasn't the bodger's fault, it's Mother Nature's fault. That's it. Finally, the teeth have to be yep. banged into the rake head. Okay. That's it, you're through. Here we go. The moment of truth awaits. OK, so here we are. Look down the line. Ooh. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I can see one out of a mirror. Well, one or two are drunk. No, that's, that's not as bad as I thought, actually. Could be better. Well, that's smashing, Ian. That really is. That's a, that's a work of art, the finished product. Well, you should be proud of that. Right, Pete, you've seen them, you've looked at them, you've looked at all the attributes. It's now up to you to make the decision. Go for it. It's a tough decision. It's a very tough decision. Really. I am quite drawn to the first Oxford we looked at, purely because of the shape of the rump. I can understand that. However, I think Mr Acton did say it can be any ram as long as it's a Shropshire. As long as it's a Shropshire? Yeah, right, I think so he wants don't... to keep the breed pure. OK, so you've now got to go for one of two. This one is slightly broader in the back, I'd say. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. Probably for that reason I'd be inclined to go for this one. It's not only livestock the team must bring in before the cold weather. Bread was a staple of the farmer's diet, so flour was crucial for winter stores. Ruth and Alex are going to make wheat into flour the traditional Victorian way. Oh, now that's wow. a sight. Look at that. <laughs> I bet you're glad to see it carrying that lot. Yes, I am. In the mid-19th century, England had around 10,000 working windmills. Only 50 or so are operating today. Wilton Windmill in Wiltshire was built in 1821. The first job is to get its sails turning. Each one is 32 feet high. Volunteer Steve Chidke has been trained to climb them. It must be pretty nerve-wracking up there, is it, Steve? <laughs> yes, it is, when you get to the top. How did you feel the first time you did this? Uh, terrified. I couldn't stop my feet from shaking. Mills were usually worked by just one miller helped by his wife or an apprentice. Just pull it snug and she's ready to go. Mike Clark has been a miller for 15 years. Whoa. Up she goes. We're going up to the <laughs> fourth floor, so we wait for three lots of bangs. Right. One. Creak, creak. It's not a rush job. Second one. When we hear the third one, I just let go and the sack will come down and oh sit on God. the closed trap doors. Oh, that's cunning, isn't it? Four flights up, the wheat grain is funnelled down again for the grinding to begin. Break off, please. Off! <laughs> So that was, what was that then? That's oh, that's taking the brake off. <laughs> Excellent. Do we go inside now? I would think so, yeah. We can start the milling. Come on, Rammy. The new Shropshire ram has arrived on the farm. What do you think of Acton Scotland? 
We've got the fields down here. This is the hall. It's going to be your new home. Mm, I know. Don't let me down. Hi, Merle. How are you? Hi, Hi Peter. I've got a ram here. I open the gate. Merle Wilson is in charge of the home farm's livestock. It's up to her to decide whether Peter's made the right choice. What are you looking for? Just to see if he's got his manly bits about him. Ah, oh, fair enough. There's no good having a ram that can't do the job. True. But this one's got both of them, so that's fine. I'm just going to look at his mouth to see that he's got his teeth. We're just looking to see that they lie nicely against the top. The top gum there. Gum. Sheep only have front teeth in the bottom of their mouths. This may make it easier for them to grab the grass with their tongues. All species of ruminant, including cattle, antelope and giraffe, lack these top front teeth. Yeah, the, it's these two big teeth here. I yeah, never, never look a gift horse in the mouth, but if you're paying through the nose for your sheep, definitely you... check its teeth. That's right. Well, what do you think of him, anyway? He's quiet, so that's very important, because some rams can be very nasty. Mm. Mr Acton will be very pleased. Well, Go he's on, yours. Tuppy. Good boy. So what's happening here? These are the millstones. So the, the bin up there that we tip the wheat in comes down this chute, feeds this hopper. And this hopper is open at the bottom to this shoe. And this shoe shakes the wheat. And this little metal four-pronged thing, you see, is called a damsel. And that damsel meters the wheat into the eye of the stone. Why is it called a damsel, then? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it chatters away all day. Chatters away all day, like a damsel. Yeah, but we're not allowed to say that. Well, we're not allowed to say that. <laughs> Each of the millstones weighs three quarters of a ton. They can move at 120 revs a minute, two turns a second. But it's all dependent on the strength of the wind. Look how quickly yes. that's dropped away again. That little gust of wind and yeah. just straight back down. We might yeah. grind to a halt. Right. So that, that's the origin of the, the expression. That is so indeed. when something grinds to a halt, it's simply because there's not enough wind and everything stopped. That's right. So can we go and see where the flower comes out? Next fall down. Well, it seems like it's totally ground to a halt now, doesn't it? I'm afraid it has. It's it such is. a funny day. It is. Well, let's have a look at this flower then. Well, let's mm. feel a bit. In product. What do you think, Ruth? We've got a quite coarse grind, haven't we? Right. Can you alter the size of the grind so you get finer or oh, coarser? Oh, indeed. Our grindstones are just up here. Right. And this screw here controls the gap between the stones. Oh, right. I see. Uh, when she's turning, you, you catch what's coming down the spout, put it between your finger and thumb, and by rule of thumb... Rule of thumb, uh, right. If it's a little coarse, no, just, just a, a, a twitch, twitch on this makes all the difference. It's a really sort of organic thing, this, isn't it? You could, you you know, everything by touch and by smell and by feel. It's all the senses used to run the mill. Being at the mercy of the elements, the Victorian farmer needed skilled judgment to know when best to sow and harvest his crops. With the hay meadow in its prime, Peters decided to seek some advice. Swallows are fairly low. Yes. Mr Acton has lived on the estate all his life and knows its climate intimately. The Victorian farmer wouldn't have had access to a daily weather forecast, so how are we going to tell what the weather's going to be like when we come to make hay? Well, he has to do the best he can with predicting from the signs that he sees. Right. Such, and as? such as these uh, swallows, which are feeding on insects, and uh, they're flying very low. That means that the air is moist. Right. If it was uh, drier, the insects would go up, and so would the swallows. Then we can look at the clouds, and we can deduce a certain amount from that. One over there, which is becoming a cumulonimbus, which is not good. I know that can drop heavy amounts of rain. 
For over 50 years, the Acton family has kept a record of rainfall on the estate. It's a crucial tool for the farmer to work out how much moisture has fallen on his crop. Now, yesterday there was quite a storm, so we decide how much it was in terms of inches by putting it into that measuring glass. And we read it, 0.29. Now, an inch of rain is 100 tonnes to every acre. So working down from that, how would you calculate it? Uh, around about the 25 tonnes per acre mark. Yes. If it's uh, 0.29 inches. That's a lot of rain. Yes. You don't want that falling on your hay if you can possibly avoid it. While the hay meadow dries, preparations for Christmas continue. Christmas was given a complete makeover by the Victorians. To find out more, Peter's come to meet toy maker Jeff Nunnery. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Peter. Good to see you. Pleasure to meet you. I love these wooden toys. Yeah. Really takes me back to my childhood. I sort of grew up in Germany. Right. And even today, it's a wash of wooden toys. Wooden toy. The Victorian age saw the birth of the toy industry, and since then, toys and Christmas have become inextricably linked. So who would be the customers in the Victorian period for these kind of toys? Well, I think there'd probably be two groups. There, there obviously, the people with the most money would get these toys, which are panel doors, the dolls. Yeah. These obviously take a lot of work, a lot of time. These are the windows for the doll's house. So they were very expensive. Yeah. Anyone with um, less income had the hoop and ball sort of toy, which was fairly simply made. Less work, less time, less expensive. Even the cheapest toys, though, were out of reach of the working classes. It was in the Victorian period that the idea of giving gifts really took off, as did many of the Christmas traditions and uh, one of these is Father Christmas. But even in the Victorian period, his identity hadn't yet been sealed. You could still see him in a number of guises, a number of different robes, but the image we all know and love today didn't come about until the 1930s when Coca-Cola had a gentleman dressed in a large red suit, white beard, very, very jolly, advertising their product. I'm hoping to pick up something that the kids at Acton Scott are gonna enjoy. Uh -huh. So, I'll probably take a couple away if I may. Yeah, no problem. For the Victorian farmer, work didn't stop for Christmas. And it was crucial to have a good store of animal feed for the winter. They weren't back. The weather's set fair for the next few days, so it's time to make hay while the sun shines. Expert local horseman Brian Davis has come to help out. Brian has brought along his highly trained pair of shires. Take it away. Whoa. And we're off. Here we go. The boy's job is to gather the cut grass into rows. This is perfect. This is good. It's, it's actually quite thick. It's... I think we're going to get a really good crop off of this. And you won't believe it, but the sun's come out as well. <laughs> How's your hay rake doing? Well, it's doing very well, actually, and I'll tell you why it's doing well. Yeah. Because Mr Acton gave me a really hot tip on how to use it. Normally, you're out in the garden, you're raking your leaves like this, yeah? Yeah. OK. But that's bad for the tines. You'll snap the tines. Right. You're supposed to use it like this, OK? I'm really getting under it. Just pulling it up Ow. and out. Yeah, very nice. Getting it. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Less chit-chat, more work. <laughs> this is only the first stage of haymaking. Once cut, the grass needs to dry out in the field. But as the day goes on, the colour of the sky doesn't bode well. 
What do you think of that, Peter? I don't think it looks good. See, that? that's cumulus nimbus right at the back. If it rains, we just deal with it. That's all we can do. We cut it now. It's a lot further than we got last year. It's heavy. Oh, I know. <laughs> In the dairy, Ruth and her daughter Eve are preparing for the hay harvest celebrations. We're making butter. So first of all, the cream goes in. This is a great thing, this Victorian churn. So it's just a barrel, really, on a hinge, so that it spins round. OK, you're the youthful muscle of this operation, so go for it. Be strong. <laughs> So what's happening inside the churn is like all the cream's being sort of agitated and bashed around and it's making all the little globules of fat bump into each other and when they bump to each other they stick together. They're joining up, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like planet formation or something. Um, and eventually we'll find that we've all the fats in one lump and we'll have a complete separation, a solid fat and a liquidy buttermilk. So what we're listening out for is that the moment that the butter comes, and that's the technical term, you'll hear this sort of wet splash because it's now separated into a solid and a liquid. Mind change. Oh, that feels different. Doesn't that it? sounds, I think. Can you hear? Yeah. They're splashing. So that's our butter and our buttermilk. The next stage is to remove the buttermilk. It's squeezed out using a 19th century invention called a butter worker. Oh, can you hear that buttermilk coming out? Yeah, definitely. This ensures the butter isn't touched by the dairy maid's hands, which could melt it. In fact, the most prized quality a dairy maid could have was cold hands. But that wasn't all they were known for. Dairy maids were considered to be, um, well, a bit sexually alluring, actually. Dairy maids have to be very, very clean. You have to keep the spaces around you scrupulously clean, you have to keep your clothes scrupulously clean. And gentlemen used to have fantasies about them. And you see that in all the literature as well. If you think, read of things like Tess of the D'Urbervilles, you know? Tess works as a dairy maid. She's clean, pure, sweet, beautiful, and, of course, has her reputation destroyed. So you watch your step, young lady. <laughs> you see anybody posh? Run a mile. Run a mile. Cover yourself in dirt. Don't let them know you do dairying. <laughs> Why do mothers have to be so embarrassing? <laughs> That'd be great for the hay harvest. I think the boys like them. Steady does it. Steady. The rain is holding off. So Alex and Peter are getting on with the next stage of haymaking, drying the cut grass to turn it into hay. This process is called tedding. The boys are keen to try it because it's featured in Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm. Good boy. It's looking good, isn't it? Let's see what this beauty can do. Yeah. Now, the thing is, is it's quite controversial, this, because a lot of the people around here have said the old way of making hay is to simply cut the grass and let the sun do the work for the first two or three days. So it dries the top of the grass and it makes it that much lighter to work with. But of course, Stevens here is recommending a new and innovative way of making hay. And the idea is that with its spikes there, its tines, it goes round the field, just picking the freshly mown grass up into the air and starts drying it out. We just need to set these spikes so they're going to touch the ground. There we go, that's, that's now pretty dangerous. You, you excited? I'm slightly nervous, to be honest, but... Um... Well, this is it, Alex, we're making hay. Let's make hay. Like Alex and Peter, Clumper's never used this equipment before. Oh, steady, Clumper. Steady, boy. Steady. Good lad. Steady, steady, steady. Steady, whoa, 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 just stand there. Something is clearly bothering him. That particularly 
Oh, it's coming over the top and hitting yeah, him. Yes, it's coming over the top and hitting him on the... On his backside. Yeah. That might be the problem. It might very well be the problem. Shall, shall I change the gears round? Yeah. Right, that's now, that's now going to kick it over the top. Ah, that's more like it. With the grass no longer falling on him, Clumper's much happier. Now that is just great to see. If he can keep his cool and I can keep my cool, we will be making hay. It's already drying out quite a bit. I mean, there's still a hell of a lot to do, but, you know, we really are getting there. Steady, boys, that's it. After a week, the hay is turning golden in the field. Yep. Now it needs raking so that it can be lifted easily onto the wagon. This is a side delivery rake which effectively combs all the hay into long rows. It's a fantastic piece of kit. So dare I say it seems as if we have a hay crop. Success at last within our grass. But before they can bring the hay in, the weather takes a turn for the worse. For several days, the crop is battered by rain. Once you've cut the hay, you're committed to making hay. And you can control pretty much every single element about it, except for the weather, and it's raining. It, it's raining hard. And it, I mean, if, if this keeps up, I mean, it, it'll be a failure. And it, it'll be deja vu, basically. We've come this far, but with this rain, it, it can now just all be lost at the last minute. It'll just rot in the field. This is awful. This is truly awful. With no hope of working outside, Ruth gets on with an indoor job, turning the freshly ground flour into bread. Traditional brick ovens like this one go back for centuries and centuries and right into the Victorian period with a best for baking bread. What I'm trying to do is make a fire inside that will heat the bricks. It's not the fire, it's the hot bricks that cook the bread. Victorian farms generally had good supplies of fuel, but most non-farmers could ill afford the firewood or coal, so bought their bread from a baker. When we went to the windmill, um, they've ground it in the flour nicely for us because all the bran is still in them. And although it's very good fibre through your system, if you have a lot of it in the bread, you get a really, very heavy bread um, that's really quite chewy. Um, and Victorians were looking for a much lighter loaf where they could possibly get it. So I want to take some of the bran out. This process is called bolting. It removes some, but not all, of the bran leaving behind a creamy coloured flour. But in the 19th century, new technology meant that all of the bran was taken out at the start of the milling process. What you get out the other end is pure ground starch. This began to cause problems with so many people living on bread, 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 bread and potatoes bread. If you've got a bread that is less nutritious, even though it's bulky, you have people having problems with their diet. In fact, it became so much of a problem that eventually they had to introduce legislation to put nutrients back into flour for bread making. Next, yeast, water and salt are added. It's starting to come together now into a mass. Now comes the really fun bit. I get to knead it. Now the longer and more vigorously I knead this, the more chance we have of having a light, a 
stuffy bread. Like every other job, this is hard work. <laughs> and it's one of those jobs that if you don't put your back into it, you really notice the difference with the finished product. After four hours, the dough has risen. So I've got to knock it back and then start shaping my dough. So the traditional shape for bread made at home in your own bread oven is the cottage loaf. So that's what I shall do. Now I'm going to rake out the oven. This bit's always a bit frantic. The fire's died down. It's nice and hot. I've got to get all this ash out quickly and the bread in before it starts to cool too much. Always a dangerous moment because you're raking, burning ashes out on top of your feet. Here we go. Bread to go in. Traditionally, ovens like these would hold 12 loaves, with perhaps a 13th to make a baker's dozen. Leave that for 45 minutes to cook. At last, the sun is out. The hay has survived the downpours. Alex has lent Ruth his handmade rake, and it's time to bring out the loader. It looks good. Okay, yep, come on. Ooh. Jesus, we're supposed to work whilst it's doing this. Here it comes! <laughs> okay. Whoa! Ah, that's it. <laughs> this is going to be extremely hard work. Coming through my legs there. Oh. <laughs> that's novel. Hey! Oh. Oh. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to build like a, it's almost like a wall of hay along one side and a wall along the other. And all the time just trampling it down and packing it down so we can get as much on here as possible. It's for me to rake up. Yeah, that's the idea, Ruth. Well, you've yeah. got to have a job, Ruth, <laughs> otherwise you'd be in the workhouse, wouldn't you? <laughs> Was that your leg? Very, very <laughs> close. <laughs> Who had money on the hay rake breaking? <laughs> Not me. We just have to get on your hands and knees now, Ruth. Oh, oh God. Keep up, come on. It's like canoeing. Good going, Peter. Whoa. This machine is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And I've only stabbed Alex once with a pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the fact that they helped save labour, hay loaders weren't popular in Victorian Britain. And Peter and Alex are discovering a possible explanation. So this is in fact one of the reasons why this thing didn't take off. <laughs> because, because you can't do this whilst you're standing, whilst it's moving. Is that the dray there? Yeah. Okay. It's all right, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> oh, Peter! Oh. <laughs> that is haymaking done. <laughs> the final job is to store the crop in the hayloft, ready to feed the animals throughout the coming winter. Their first major task in the run-up to Christmas is complete. It's an absolute joy to find myself almost immersed in hay because I really didn't think I'd see the day. Tell you what, Alex. Yeah? I need a beer. <laughs> <laughs> After all the work and worry, a triumphant hay harvest calls for a party. Now it was as the sun was shining bright in the high days of the year. It was down in yonder... Folk musician John Kirkpatrick has come to celebrate with the team. 
dishes How they do sport and play Causing many a lad and many a lass Together a-making hay Causing many a lad and many a He's chosen one of the few haymaking songs with a wholesome theme. Most are much racier in tone. Corn harvest and hay harvest were the biggest times of the year where everyone would muck together and so you'd spend all day with people of the opposite sex and so a lot of these songs deal with sort of running off around the back of the haycocks and having a bit of a frolic in the hay and, you know, guaranteed a different harvest of a different kind <laughs> in a few months. <laughs> uh, may, maybe this is why they're introducing machines to get rid yes. of the labour force. <laughs> That's why they had to invent machinery. <laughs> Here we go. It's time for the homemade bread and butter. Oh, you've got some there. Okay. That butter's nice. And that bread. No, it's got something to it. It's absolutely mm. delicious, isn't it? But does the hay meet Mr. Acton's exacting standards? Hello, Mr. Acton. Hello, Mr. Oh. Acton. Hello, Eric. Hello, Peter. Is this a sample? This is a sample, yes. View inspection. Yes, not bad at all. Can you tell a lot from the smell of the hay, then? Oh, yes, you can, yes. Yes, um, it needs to smell sweet. If it smells musty, that means uh, um, spores of mould, and uh, that's not good for the animals. Right. Yes, each time I smell it, it smells better. Well, well that's a good sign. <laughs> I think the animals will uh, relish it during the winter. Mm. OK, folks, we're going to do Sir Roger de Coverley, a lovely old English country dance. It's been done for hundreds of years. And fascinatingly, in Scotland, this dance is called the Haymaker's Jig, so it's very appropriate. And it's mentioned in A Christmas Carol as well as one of the classic country dances for Christmas time, so it'll get you in the mood for Christmas. And right hand turn. And the other. Left. Keep swinging, keep swinging. Hands. Back to back. We now have a hayloft brimming with freshly mown hay, so... All well, done let's, and dusted. Let's One hope. weight off our minds. Two hands. Yeah, well, that hay's going to last the cattle over winter. Yep. Yeah, Congratulations. Absolutely. Congratulations. Back to back. Roll on Christmas, eh? Yeah. Cheers. Bar humbug. Down the middle. Next time on Victorian right. Farm, so... Christmas approaches. Thoughts turn to presents, treats, and staving off the cold. Professional brick. There are 10,000 bricks to be made. And it's tough. It is so tough. And a blacksmith's forge to get up and running. <laughs>